Well, I'm wondering if you have ever heard of the Terracotta Army. Has anybody heard of the Terracotta Army? Okay. It's a collection of sculptures depicting the armies of the first emperor of China, Chen Shi Huang. He ruled at a time when various provinces were at war with one another. As a great military leader, he conquered province after province, creating the Chen Dynasty for which China was probably named. Chen Shi Huang had an expansive vision for his country. His public works projects included the unification of diverse state walls into what would later become the Great Wall of China and a massive new national road system. One of the emperor's greatest concerns was his own death. He undertook a futile search for an elixir of immortality, which he, of course, did not find. And realizing that he could not avoid death, he used his wealth and his power to build a city-sized mausoleum and a life-sized terracotta army to guard it. And the purpose was to protect the emperor in his afterlife. By the time that Chen Shi Huang died in 210 BC, his mausoleum was surrounded by more than 8,000 soldiers, along with chariots and horses. And it is astounding to me how China's first emperor focused his vast resources on himself. He took everything that he had at his disposal and used it for himself, primarily to assuage his fear of the afterlife. 200 years, I mean, I'm sorry, 200 years later and 4,000 miles away, a Jewish rabbi named Jesus of Nazareth began to teach people about another kingdom, the kingdom of God. Chen Shi Huang, uh, like Chen Shi Huang, Jesus brought people together, but not into a nation of physical boundaries or a dynasty based on birthright. Jesus welcomed people into a kingdom that would extend over every national boundary and unite people across time. Rather than teaching people to amass a fortune and to amass power in this life, as opposed to creating a false sense of security for the afterlife, Jesus taught his followers to be generous with love, forgiveness, and kindness. He taught them to be careful about the unusual gravity of money, wealth, and possessions, which would draw them away from the kingdom of God. He told a story about a man who had an unusually large harvest, but rather than sharing with others, he built bigger barns so that he could keep it all for himself and live extravagantly. And Jesus finished the story in this way. And we'll have this on the screen. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. Now, this idea of being rich toward God is crucial. Both Chen Shi Huang and Jesus taught about the afterlife. One built the ultimate bigger barn, <laughs> a palace mausoleum guarded by terracotta soldiers that he thought would protect him in eternity, but which were slowly covered by dirt and, fr and fell apart. In contrast, Jesus told people this, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And why did Jesus teach these things? Because he wanted 
what was best for us, for you, and for me. He wasn't focused on securing himself. He was focused on helping us to discover the kind of life that God intends. Abundant life, brimming over with meaning, value, purpose, brimming over with freedom, peace, and joy. He wanted us to know that we could live in the kingdom of God starting right now. That we don't have to wait until death because the kingdom is not someplace in a galaxy far, far away, but is already here ready to receive us if we have eyes to see and ears to hear. Jesus taught that we enter this kingdom by following him and that we help expand it in our circles of influence as we do the will of God and as we align our lives with the purposes of God. And we have no fear of death because Jesus' offer of salvation secures our life in the love and care of God. In response to this incredibly good news, Jesus told us to live a generous life. And that living this way would result in two gifts. First, as I just mentioned, it would give us a strong sense of meaning, value, and purpose in this life, and also a deeper assurance of our salvation as we live according to what we know to be God's will. But second, it would empower us to be a blessing to others. God blesses us so that we can bless others. Rather than hoard all that we have for selfish enjoyment, Jesus wanted us to be a launch pad for others. And to help us better understand what I mean by launch pad, we have a video that we would like to play for you this morning. So this inflated looking raft thing is called the blob. And one person sits on the end of the blob and a second person jumps from up high, launching the one on the end high into the air. And in the video, everyone enjoys launching and being launched except for one young man named Tony. Tony understands the concept, but he is fearful of heights and he's scared to jump. He's like some people when it comes to generosity. 
He understands how it works, but he is reluctant to take the risk. But after watching everyone else take the leap, and after a little encouragement from his friends, he finds the courage to take the risk, jumping and launching someone else. And judging by the expression on his face, it was worth it. Likewise, when we are generous, we inspire and help launch others. Take the food pantry, for example, which is meeting today. When you are generous and either bring food or donate money so that we can purchase food, it provides for the needs of the people in our community who are down on their luck. When they come and get food and are treated as an honored guest of Jesus, it not only meets an immediate need, but it also has the potential to launch them, to fill the gap long enough so that they can find a new job that will enable them to, to take care of themselves or their families. And once they get back on their feet, they may return and help others. You know, this happened to me at the end of my time in Nashville, Tennessee. I was a full-time graduate student, and my wife at the time was the primary breadwinner. When we decided to separate, I didn't have enough money to buy my oldest son's medication. I was able to get Medicaid for several months until I could take my first church in Dundee, Florida, which is about two hours inland and that allowed me to fully support my family. When I got to the, uh, to the office to apply for assistance, I was only looking for Medicaid, and they looked at me and said, Mark, after looking at all of your expenses and your income, um, you also qualify for food stamps, which was a little embarrassing for me. But I needed it, and I took it, and I used it. What was interesting is that I didn't need it forever but I needed it for a little while. I needed generous people to help fill the gap and to launch me into a new season. And in addition to the health insurance and the food assistance, I had a friend named Matt Charlton who was the pastor of a church and he needed someone to help him do some manual labor for the church and he had an expense account, which is called a pastor's discretionary account. And that allows the pastor to help people in need without revealing their names to the church so that there's no embarrassment. And he actually hired me to help do manual labor and paid me through his expense account. And it was through all of that help that it got me through several months uh, until I could support myself. And then God provided, and I didn't need it anymore. And knowing this experience, it has given me a passion to help people who are struggling through transitions. And so when people contact me and say, I need help, I need a hotel room, or I need someone to help me pay my light bill, or I need money for medications, I take the money that you provide to the pastor's discretionary account and I freely give because I want to pass it on. You know, once Jesus told a somewhat confusing parable of a dishonest steward. And at the end of the parable, he said this, which will be projected on the slide. We read it this morning. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? Friends, when we are generous and bless others, we find the true riches of life. So often, people spend their time building terracotta soldiers. And this is why we talk so much about generosity, about overcoming the human tendency to gather for ourselves when we should be sharing for others or sharing with others. And I look around at our country today, and I look at who are the people that we are empowering for leadership? Who are the people that we are lifting up on a pedestal and claiming that they're, they're the people that should be the role models? And when I look at those folks, and I ask, are they more like the first emperor of China or Jesus? 
it saddens me to see that they're often like the first emperor of China. They're focused on themselves. They're focused on self-aggrandizement, of accumulating wealth and power so that they can lord it, other peop- lord it over other people to increase their power and wealth so that they can be served by others instead of putting a towel around their waist as Jesus did and serving in humble, self-sacrificial love. And friends, in the church, we don't celebrate Caesar. Are you awake? We don't, we don't celebrate Caesar. We don't turn to Caesar for salvation. Caesar said that if you want salvation, it came through peace, but it was a peace through violence. We don't celebrate Caesar. We don't turn to Caesar for salvation. We turn to Jesus. And Jesus was the greatest servant of all. We see this in the Gospel of John when he knelt down and washed his disciples' feet. Humble service. He didn't accumulate wealth. He didn't accumulate power. He leveraged everything that he had in humble service to others, investing in them, being generous, trying to help them find the life that God intends for them. And so should we. But there's this gravitational pull toward more, more money, more power, more influence, more cars, more clothes, more, 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 more. And so Jesus warns us about the dangers of money, wealth, and possessions. He says the following, which we also read this morning. No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in wealth. Because Jesus knew that the very things that we possess, if we are not careful, will come to possess us. And once they possess us, they will transform us into something that looks nothing like the values we hope to embody. And sin is cunning and baffling and powerful. And we can get to a point to when we don't even realize it. But there's good news. And the good news is that you don't have to be enslaved to your possessions. You can freely release them to bless others in a life of generosity. And it's not only Jesus, my friends, but almost all of the great religious teachers of the world, some of the greatest philosophers of the world, all of them say the same thing. If you want to be happy, if you want to have true joy, then it's not about accumulating for yourself. It is about gratitude and generosity. We are grateful for what we have, and in response to that gratitude, we give ourselves and our stuff away to help others. Jesus says, if you try to save your life, if you try to secure yourself, you will lose it. But, and there's the good news, right? But, If you are willing to lay down your life, to lay down your rights, to lay down your agenda for Jesus in the sake of the gospel, then you will what? You will find it. The message hasn't changed. And This message is the last one in our four-part series on generosity. And I really hope that you have had a lot of opportunities to pray and reflect about your own life, your own journey. And if you've been with us over the last four weeks, you'll know that I've been issuing a challenge every week. And my challenge today, the final challenge, is called the generosity challenge. Now, we have a lot of first-time guests here today, and if you are a guest of ours this morning, this challenge is not for you, okay? 
I would rather uh, encourage you to use this time to be reflecting and praying about how you might be more generous in your everyday life. So the challenge this morning is for the members of our church. So again, if you're a guest, this is the only time that I will give you permission to tune me out and to turn to quiet prayer and reflection because we're going to do some in-house business here for a second. Members of our church, if we have your address, then you received a letter from me several days ago along with an estimated giving card. And I'm going to ask the ushers too. I think Jossie and Tim, if you guys could grab some of those extra cards back there, we're going to hand them out to folks that don't have them or forgot to bring them. We might want, if you're a member and you're willing to help, uh, you might want to help Tim and Jossie too. If we had a couple more, it would make this go a little more quickly. And in the letter that you received from me, I ask you to be praying about what percentage of your income God is calling you to give to the mission of Jesus to the ministries of our church. The goal was for you to make a careful and prayerful decision, and if you have a family, to do that with your family, to complete the card and to bring it back to church this morning. If you did not do this, then in just a few minutes, I'm going, I'm sorry, if you did do this and you have your completed card, I'm going to invite you in just a minute to come forward and bring your card and place it on the altar in front of the Bible. Um, If you did not get a card in the mail or you forgot to bring it and you would like to get one, uh, then I want to invite you at this time just to slip up your hands and the ushers have cards available. So we have someone over here. If there's anyone that didn't receive one, just slip up your hand and we'll get you one. Now, if you've already been praying about this and you know what God is calling you to give, then you can take the blank card, go ahead and fill it out now and bring it up to the altar uh, with some of the others. Um, But if you have not looked at your budget and you've not prayed about this, we don't want you to make a hasty decision. We want you to take time this week to, um, to prayerfully discern what God is calling you to give. And again, this is not about the number. This is about what God is calling you to give. And uh, so we want to invite you to spend a little time in prayer as people bring their cards forward this morning. Uh, be in prayer throughout the week. Be in conversation with your family. Make your decision, fill out the card, and bring it back uh, next Sunday. Or you can also mail it to the church. So as we bring our estimated giving cards to the front, I also want to invite you to bring any tithe or offering that you have. If you haven't already put it in the giving boxes and you would like to put that up front as well, then you can do that. Um, But I'd like us to continue to offer God our worship this morning um, by our commitment to living a generous life. So if you have your cards, we invite you to come at this time. Hey everyone, this is Pastor Mark, and I want to thank you for listening today. I also want to thank First United Methodist Church of Cocoa Beach, the faith community I am honored to serve and that helps make this ministry possible. If you are being blessed by these messages, I invite you to support the mission of Jesus through the efforts of our church by making a donation. Simply go to our website, www.fumccb.com, and click on the link that says Give. I also hope that you will explore other parts of our website and connect to other ministries like online worship and Bible studies. If you feel more comfortable, you can also mail a donation to the church office at 3300 North Atlantic Avenue, Cocoa Beach, Florida, 32931. We sincerely appreciate your support as we try to help people who are struggling and need to hear good news. Again, thanks for tuning in today, and may God bless you.